What's up, YouTube? I am Robert, and this is the Biker Bar Podcast live stream, episode 97. I really like, did I recover well from that? Because all of a sudden, as soon as I said, what's up, YouTube, fucking forgot everything. So... <laughs> Nonetheless, episode 97 with Jeff Lenowski. If you don't, Lenowski, Lenowski, Lenowski. I always want to put a W in there. I don't know why. But anyways, we'll talk about that later. Let's go ahead and, and get ripping into the good, exciting stuff. Right out here, out the gate, I have this sponsor of a few episodes. And they like, they're, they're deciding whether or not they want to actually be part of the whole biker thing. But... They want to see some sales. So this is where I need you guys to freaking do it. You, you ever heard of Manscaped? They sell a razor, like a body trimmer. And basically, I know you guys out there buying carbon bikes, just upgraded your brakes to something else because you're trying to shave a few grams. Look at this, dude. Shave the beard right off with my, my Manscaped trimmer. Boom. Drop like 57 grams, man. I, well, that would cost you like $1,000 in bike, bike parts. You can do it for like 60 bucks or 70. I don't even know how much the thing costs. Go to manscaped.com. You can save 20% off and get free shipping. So if you've been thinking about it, it's a good way, good way to lose some weight, shave some grams, man. I lost at least a half a pound of hair off my back. And um, I know there's some roadies out there, a couple of you gra gravel guys. You, you want to you wanna get first place? You want to get that PR? Shave the legs. Boom. You got it. Just swing by manscaped.com, use B1KER as the coupon code, get free shipping, 20% off, you'll be winning. You'll be top of the game. People will be like, how did he get that KOM? There you go. Just like that. Anyways, if you guys want something for free, swing by my Instagram or my Facebook at BikerB1. It'd be awesome to see a little, little those numbers rise. If you enjoy the podcast, hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening to this on some other platform, go ahead and write a review. If it's there, that would be awesome. I, some of those podcast platforms don't have a review spot. So if you listen on Apple, you can definitely write one there. Um, Outside of that, I don't know what else to tell you guys. Let's just go ahead and get started. Jeff's got a short, a short amount of time tonight. What's up, Jeff? Oh, I didn't. I, he's just, you know what? God, I didn't. I feel muted. horrible. Can you hear me? Yeah, I unmuted you. Okay. It, it was totally like my fault. I, um, We're just starting the podcast and I got to tell you, I feel horrible because you did that intro and I didn't realize when I was visiting you last week, I saw the Manscaped shaver in the shower and I thought it was for other stuff and I didn't realize that's what you use to shave your face. So I just want to <laughs> get ahead of that and apologize right off the bat. <laughs> Dude, I was reading their I website. I didn't realize that's the shaver you use on your face. I'm sorry. Oh, you could use it wherever you want, man. Uh, apparently, that thing's good for the jingly janglies, man. You can, you can <laughs> buy one for your lady. Save yourself 20%, and hey, you guys will both be happy. Happy, hairless, and freaking faster. <laughs> I don't. All right, so you you kind of missed that joke. But anyway, you look really good. That, that oh, thank you. Making, I, I mean, it's definitely making you look... Awesome. Some people are listening to this on a podcast. Some people are watching a YouTube video. I mean, I think you look better than I've ever seen. And I don't oh, think thanks, it's a coincidence. Dude. I think it's the I think it's the Manscaped trimmer. I think it is. I think it is. That's definitely the way that that's what it is. I'll be honest with you right now, Jeff. I have like I've 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 slid I've slid back a little bit. So I am my goal is I put on some weight and then I was like oh man, I, I had gained like 10 or 15 pounds and I was like, shit, I'm about to go on vacation. I went down to the Keys. And if anybody's ever been to Florida Keys, there is absolutely nothing healthy to do there. Like the only I thing I would imagine the only do, thing to there is to put on pounds. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. eat and drink and then drink while you're eating and then, you know, just keep doing that. And yeah. uh, so like right before I, I was leaving for that, I was like, all right, man, you need to get your shit together because... If you go to the keys already, like, like not happy about how much weight you put on, you're going to come back and be really upset. So like for like a month beforehand, I like locked it down and lost like about 10 pounds and uh, then went to the keys and, and I was like, okay, as soon as I come back, I'm going to get like hitting it. And then California just like lit on fire. So it was like all of a sudden now I couldn't ride. And then I forgot my son was coming. And so my son came back from the army and I just used that as another excuse to 
keep freaking eating and drinking, right? So basically Monday, my goal is to see how close I can get to the goal weight by the time we get to Sedona. So so that's like, what? Uh, I was just looking at the calendar today. So is that two and a half months? Yeah, something like that. Because I, I think that's like the second week or something like that in November. So we just right, call so it if you get months. if you get to the goal, I will throw you a big party at the Sedona Fat Tire Festival. And make sure that we get you back on the other side of that goal. Oh, yeah, dude. Definitely. Oh, there's nothing like four days at Sedona. I'm, I guarantee I can put on at least 10 pounds there. <laughs> I don't understand how you go to mountain bike festivals. I do it all the time. Well, you, back in the day. You right. go to a mountain bike festival and you gain weight. You're supposed to go to a mountain bike festival and lose weight. But then there's like partying and drinking and whatever. And you're like, how'd that yeah. happen? Yeah, yeah. It's definitely... Um, it's definitely rough when that happens because you're like, I don't know, man. I love the Sedona Mountain Bike Festival, though, you know, and uh, it's always a good time. There, there's, there's too many opportunities to drink a lot of beer at that fest. Yeah, like, in my line like, of work, you really have to be a politician, and it's hard. You know, you can't publicly pick favorites, but the Sedona Festival—that's my favorite. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, if you're judging that against something like like Sea Otter, it's definitely um, hands down Sedona. Who was I was talking to somebody, and they said that one that they do in in um, in Oregon that's up by uh, it's like in between Bend and Portland. I forget the name of that city. It's like a Oak, Oakdale Oak something. I guess they that's they have one. Radar. Yeah, yeah, I heard that one's pretty. Fun. Have you been to that one? I haven't been to that one. It's been on my radar. It seems pretty fun. Um, I mean, the thing that's awesome about the Sedona Festival is like, it just seems like everybody spends a lot more time at the event. Yeah. Um, at some of the other festivals, people come, demo a bike, leave. Yeah. Sea Otters. Sea Otters is just so big. It's hard. Like, yeah. like going to party in New York City. How do you go party in New York City? I'd rather go party in the smallest town ever where you have right. like 10 friends. You know, right, it's just right. better. Um, so I really, really enjoy it. Sedona Fat Tire Festival. Nemba Fest used to be really fun in oh, Vermont, yeah. but that stopped maybe two years ago. Um, but that one was awesome. Yeah, the one that that one that's up there in Oregon, and I think it's Mountain Bike Oregon. I think that's what it's called. And uh, the I, I'm pretty sure the person I was talking to was saying that um, you camp at the fest too. So it's kind of oh. like everybody's hanging out it's kind of a riding thing but then it's like everybody's partying because everybody's like camping there so you're kind of like definitely going to have a good time in that aspect you know yeah so i have a van check video coming out in the next couple of weeks if people follow me on youtube they probably have seen or instagram they've seen i have like the adventure van and whatever and i love camping until the morning it's yeah. awesome saying say, it's awesome staying up with your buddies oh yeah barbecuing grilling whatever out of your van camping but then there's always that dude that's up at six o'clock in the morning or 5 30 in the morning and you're just like go to sleep like oh yeah let's wake up in two hours you were totally going a different direction than me i was like yeah it's awesome until the hangover kicks in dude <laughs> well that's i mean no it's the same direction right in a hotel, you can close this you can close the shades and crank up the air conditioning and right. sleep till nine o'clock ten o'clock at, at right. the festival you're hung over and there's yeah. that dude waking you up at six o'clock in the morning and you just right. like, yeah, no, we, we were yeah. going in the same exact direction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, most of the time when I'm camping out here, I'm camping at elevation. And for some reason, I don't know if it's like a thing or not, but I get like really bad hangovers when I'm like drinking at elevation, you know, it's like it's something about hangover. being at yeah. like 7,000 feet or something like that. And you're like, I don't know. You wake up the next day and it's like, this feels way worse than it should right now. You know, are you, you're not at elevation where you live, right? No, no. Sacramento is like 300 feet or something like that. It's like, okay. it's like yeah, so barely it's, above sea level. And yeah. So you it's get, similar to where I am. Like, yeah. When I go to elevation, it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. I mean, the, the, have, the, the, the the fortunate thing is that we can drive to it like every weekend. So like in the summer, as far as riding goes, like you get pretty used to it. But um, yeah, when you're hiking or camping, what were you going to say though? Just like when I go to places at elevation, cause I live in New Jersey and it's sea level, you know, 
pretty yeah. much. I mean, it might be a couple hundred feet or whatever. Um, it's super tough. Like I, I notice that like I yawn a lot. I think definitely uh-huh. it's like a physiological response to just not getting enough oxygen or whatever. Right. Um, you know, obviously when you ride it the first few days, it feels like, yeah. you know, um, and then the worst part is when I go visit Reeb, like all those dudes are super strong and they like to drink beers. So I'm just on my heels the whole time. <laughs> I come from Flatland. You go up right. there, they're like mile high club over there. And next they're thing just you know, setting they're, you up for every, like, every, yeah, every beer you drink is like five for me because I'm not used to the elevation. And then they're like hammer <laughs> hills and I can't sleep. So the first, it usually takes me a week to acclimate that for sure. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's rough, man. That's definitely real rough. But, but I'm sure it's, still, I'm sure it's a good time though, man. How are you enjoying working with them? It's awesome. I think uh, I was just saying to somebody earlier today, it's been three and a half years now. It's like literally the best decision I've ever made. So it's mm-hmm. been really, really good. That's good, dude. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm super the brand is, the brand is growing. The guys in the shop keep making better bikes than ever. Um, you know, it's such a small company that you interact with most buyers, you know, you don't really have the opportunity to do that with, with most bike companies for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's chances are, if you, if you're buying a Reeb, I've messaged you on Instagram or answered an email or something like that. And the guys just keep doing better and better work. It's, it's awesome. It was super fun chatting with them on, um, on the biker bar as well. So for those of you guys that haven't seen that episode or listened to that episode, go go on back and check it out. I appreciate you setting that up. That was awesome. By yeah, the way. So you had Adam and Tim and Adam. He, so when he was on there, we always say how like he builds the bikes and he, and he races them and whatever. And there's not that many bike builders that are awesome riders. And with COVID and stuff, you know, like nobody's gotten out and raced for a long time, but right. he just went to, uh, Went to a big enduro in Colorado last weekend and ended up on a podium again on a bike that he built. Actually, oh, nice. I think a bike that you guys talked about. It's the Pinion, um, Chrome oh, yeah. Pinion bike that he prototyped. Took that thing and ended on a podium with like stacked field, Nate Hills, all kinds of Colorado dudes. And, oh, and wow. The dude, the dude builds beautiful bikes and he's like super legit rider. Right on. That's yeah, super it's fun. awesome. Yeah. So you said you're a... Uh, you're you're dropping that uh van build video next week yeah i think uh i've owned that van for three years now pretty sure it's about three years and i made a van build video when i first got it and i've just changed so much stuff on it recently and you know with with the whole world the way it is right now so many people are asking questions about the van and how i built it out and i kind of like it because other than like the rack on the roof and and one piece of furniture inside like i did all the work myself which i think is i don't know i've always been like enjoyed doing handyman stuff like that yeah so, that's super fun man and uh i don't know like a lot of people are building bands and whatever so i just figured it's something cool to make and the other thing was i was in north carolina with a friend of mine and i went to shoot some other videos and it was like literally like 96 degrees every day 100 percent humidity so we were like, oh, so freaking hot. Like <laughs> it was twofold. I wanted people to see the van, but I was also like, what can we do that doesn't involve a lot of physical effort? Cause it's so <laughs> damn hot every single day. Let's just make a van video and like check it out. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. awesome, man. I'm, um, I, I could be in a van next week. I don't know, man. I heard you I talking just, about that. You know, yeah. I was talking about last week with BKXE. And little did I know that my truck was going to get the synopsis from the dealer that I need to either put in a new engine or get rid of it. So I'm like, they, they told me it's like 13 grand for, for replacing the engine. And, uh, like the truck doesn't work. Like it's that. Yeah. There was, there's some issues going on and I took it into the, the dealer and whenever they were checking it out, um, they said that there's like some metal in the engine. And so they're like, something's like causing this metal to be in mixed in with the oil and stuff. So they're like, you know, we could charge you to rebuild it, but that's going to cost a bunch of money. Or you could buy a new engine, which will cost about the same as us rebuilding it, but you'll have a new engine, you know? Yeah. So like, that's like, 
they're telling me like roughly thirteen thousand dollars. So it's like at this point, I'm like, I was really contemplating buying the van anyway. So I'm like, maybe I just freaking say like, what do you guys give me for it? it? It sucks though because I um, I put a lot of money in the truck this year, like new tires and brakes and like what kind of car spent, was it? It's an F one fifty. So I mean, it's not like it's a like a something cheap, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Well, it's tough. Yeah, I don't want to be Debbie Downer. Here's the part that sucks. So I have my van, and uh -huh. I drive a shit ton. So um, I just flipped 127,000 miles, and it's car works great. Like it's fine. Uh -huh. But now that I've rebuilt this thing, or I, you know, I made that video a few years ago, built it out, changed a bunch of stuff, like. That's why I always like doing it myself because I I like, you know, once you live in something, you change it, you know. So yeah, like, yeah. The first, when I first got it, I built it out and I built it out kind of shitty because I knew I wasn't going to want to like keep it that way. So I built it out and then there was a bunch of things I wanted to change and then I built it out nice. Because you originally later, built it out like here. still wanted to keep the seats in so your kids could I did, ride. yeah, because I have three kids. So I was like, let me build it out. Till, so I could drive everybody. I bought a passenger van. So I kind of went a different route than a lot of the guys. I bought a passenger yeah. van. And like I say in the video, the reason I bought a passenger van was a few reasons. Like in 2017 or 2018, when I bought it, there was so many passenger vans coming off lease. So it was super easy to find passenger yeah. van off lease, low mileage, pretty cheap. Right. And I didn't want to build it out from scratch because that's like a huge commitment. And I'm not a professional van builder. I'm pretty, pretty handy, but I'm not a professional van builder. And I, I've never seen anybody that built it out themselves where it doesn't have all those, like, it looks good on the surface, but then you start really looking into it and it's not finished that great. And so yeah. I knew that would be my van. So I was like, you know what? Got three kids. I got to drive them around. I want everybody to have seat belts. I want air conditioning in the back, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to buy a passenger van, strip that. And the other thing is I had a rooftop tent. So I knew that my sleeping quarters were going to be on the roof anyway. Oh, uh, okay. It, it's just like I'm six four. Yeah. I'm not gonna I'm gonna have a half ass bed inside. It's gonna suck. Right. I love going to Lowe's and buying a sheet of plywood, even though nowadays you can't afford a sheet of plywood because it's like five thousand right? dollars. That's just freaking like but gold like, now. Yeah. But like I like doing projects. I want to throw stuff in my van. So my van, when you open the back doors, it still has I could put big stuff in it, you know. Right. Um what was that whole combination of things? Um so I bought the passenger van because it was a really good deal now it's at 127,000 miles so the other day i was just like you know what i built this whole van out i could use this as a template to maybe build a new one because once right. you do it once it's really easy to do it the second time so yeah like, yeah maybe, you, like, maybe you, know I can... what you did wrong or like whatever right totally yeah and, and like my friend dave just built me this super sick like drawer storage unit for under the passenger seat it's really cool like three three drawers and whatever and it's like oh you should make these for other people to buy because every single Ford van right. is like that. And once you, te once you template it once, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're all over it. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I, I mean, I was on the couch board, like, you know what? Let me go on autotrader.com and just see like what a new van would cost. Dude, right. They're like through the roof nowadays. It's insane. Yeah. Everything's like when I bought my van, it was the sticker price was 48,000. It had 20,000 miles on it and I got it for 28,000. So twenty thousand dollars less for twenty thousand miles. Even if they never change oil, that's like a good deal in my book. Right, you know? right. That same van, like if you were to buy a van with twenty thousand miles now, it's fifty five thousand dollars on the East Coast. Yeah, I got it for twenty eight. Yeah. Like it's insane. Yeah, so the whole kind of used sucks. car market is like super freaking hot right now. Right, and um, but and then new cars are hard to get too. Yeah, pickups are holding their value too. So maybe you could trade yours in. That was sweet. Like yeah, I but, in but a pickup truck minus the part that the fucking engine's all screwed up. So like, I'm pretty sure I'm like, I don't know. Maybe like, take yeah. it to one of those places where they like just give you, you know, drag in, push in, whatever. They give you. A, a yeah, yeah. Well, that. I mean, honestly, like, if I wanted to be, yeah, yeah, it, it's um. It's a question, you know what I mean? It's like one of those things where like and some people are saying in the chat like it could you could get it cheaper. I'm sure I could get it built cheaper or whatever, but um it's kind of like like uh at this point it's just really questionable cuz I I man I was so close on pulling the trigger on the van, you know. So 
it's kind of like almost like like here's your sign like just do it like stop freaking bullshitting about it you know yeah but on the other hand it's like i don't really want to pay a freaking car payment right now and like 13 grand like it's yeah it's a lot of money but i can definitely pay through that quicker than fifty thousand dollars for a new van and and not oh, only yeah. like fifty thousand dollars for a new van because i know i'm not going to half-ass my build either so i'm going to spend right probably you know i would guess like twenty thousand dollars building it i mean you're not going to feel it it's going to be like nickel and dimed right but like you definitely get nickel and dimes like the, you know an awning 1500 or a refrigerator yeah, yeah. a thousand yeah. and a battery yeah. 500 yeah <laughs> it adds like, up. so like like as you're doing it you're like oh this isn't that bad but like at the end of the day you're like if you sat down and like spreadsheeted it all out you're like oh wow that still costs a lot <laughs> Yeah. So the good thing for you is you could use it as a full write-off part of your business. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the the car payment thing is tough. Like that's why I didn't, I didn't originally, I, I just always guessed the whole, re the other whole reason I got that van was my whole life. I would just, I, I, I was super lucky. I was sponsored by Schwinn Toyota for a long time. Oh, wow. So I always okay. just got new cars. Like when I, when I turned 26, like I had a beater car when I got my license and then I bought like a Chevy S10 and I drove that forever. And then the next thing you know, I got sponsored by Schwinn when I graduated college and I got free cars or free wow. leases. Yeah. Yeah. From, from 96 to about 2010 or something. Right. And then I, so then I was, then when that so like relationship 15 years was, of never having to pay for a car yeah and then that relationship was over so i was like oh i guess i need another new car i'll just finance a dodge ram pickup so i finance a dodge ram pickup i bought a 2014 because that relationship ended in 2010 but then uh -huh. i owned that last car uh-huh uh long story like i was sponsored by in 2010 i was sponsored by toyota and kicker car audio oh, so nice. i got this deal with kicker where they were like, Hey, we'll give you know, part of the sponsorship, we'll give you all the gear you want. How loud do you want your car stereo? And I was like, as loud as possible. So I literally right. had one of those like ridiculous cars where you could dance quarters on the hood. It was so oh, nice. <laughs> but this was during the motocross era. So like, this is when you see like Ricky Carmichael and Jeremy McGrath, all these guys were sponsored by kicker and kicker used to build out all these like super expensive cars that the moto guys would have. They'd stayed, they'd build out like Mercedes S class cars and whatever. I guess somewhere along the line, somebody messed up one of their cars because they used to, it used to be set up. Like if you were sponsored by kicker, you'd go to your local installer kicker would give them like extra parts to like do your install, you know, so it didn't cost uh -huh. the people, the athletes money. And right. I guess somewhere along the line, they must've screwed up somebody's install and, and it cost kicker a ton of money. So then after uh -huh. that, it's like, we'll give you all the audio stuff you want, but you got to cover the installation. Uh, and I didn't okay. know. So, so when they were like, how loud do you want your car? I was like, as loud as possible. Like, right. what kind of question is that? Right. So I had like, a, I think it was like 5,000 watts or something. I'm not like tech guy. I just know yeah. that like when I turned it loud, you'd vibrate your windows and I'd laugh with my friends. Like it's so ridiculously loud. It was unbelievable. So <laughs> that got put in that 2010 Toyota, uh, Toyota Sequoia. Uh huh. When that relationship ended, they would always it's a it was it wasn't a free car they would prepay a lease uh-huh so then they prepaid a lease and it was a they would pay a thirty five thousand mile a year lease but i didn't drive thirty five thousand miles i might have had like fifty thousand miles on that car so it was worth way more than it was if i just gave it back so uh -huh. that relationship ended and it's like well i had i could pay off this car for like 20 grand that's awesome and it has a twenty thousand dollar stereo in it like right right i'm gonna just buy this car Right. So then I I drove that car till it was whatever it was like I don't know three four years or something. Yeah. So when I bought my van, off. exactly. So when I bought my van, or when I bought that Ram pickup, it was a twenty fourteen. Yeah. So four years I drove that Sequoia, and I traded in for the Ram pickup, and I had that Ram pickup, and that was paid off. So it was really hard. Like I was like, I don't really want a car payment again, but. That 20, 2018, when I bought that car, was the year that my son turned 17. And I was introduced to the world of used cars because, I don't know, I don't I don't understand how I just never did that. I just always avoided it. Like, I just never had to buy a car or whatever. So I was, just would finance a new car. 
Right. And then when my son Jack turned 17, I went to this car lot looking for a used car. And I was like, holy shit, there's like a whole world of awesome cars out here. It's like half price. This is like the right. best thing ever. So right, that was right. the thing. I was like, oh, I guess I don't need a new van for $45,000, $50,000. I get a used van. And then I yeah. started looking for used vans. And I saw that one. And I was like, well, shit. If it's 48 new and it's 28 with 20,000 miles, I'm buying a van. So I yeah. traded in that pickup truck and bought the van. And I didn't want to do it because it was so cliche, but it really is right. very convenient. It's very, very, very convenient. That's the thing, man. Like, there's the other, see, man, I have this freaking internal battle with this thing. Like, on one hand, I think the reason that I really want a van is because I really want to build it. Like, I really want that project. Like you were talking, like you enjoy doing that stuff. Like, that's how I feel about it. Like, I feel like it would be really fun, like researching all this shit and like looking it up and just doing like having that experience and that life experience, you know? And yeah. um, I I just don't know how much I actually would like use it in terms of driving somewhere and sleeping in it. You know what I mean? Like, like, like the money that I spend to do that, I don't feel like financially like plays out better than me, like getting $20,000 worth of freaking hotel rooms. You, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So it's like, so there's that part of it. Right. Then there's the other part of it where it's like, Hey man, this would be great for the channel. Like blah, blah, blah. Right. All that shit. Right. Um, and then on the other hand, I'm like, dude, I could also just go, and buy a $1,500 freaking topper for my truck and build some kind of thing that I can sleep in the back of that. And now I can drive wherever the fuck I want in that and sleep in it just fine too. Yeah, You, you know what I mean? Totally. So no, that's I where mean, it's I, like, go ahead. I was going to say, I grew up in New Jersey. So for me, for the first 47 years of my life, I was like, ew, why would you want to camp? Like, why would you want to camp when you when you can just get a hotel room? Right. <laughs> right. I was like, camping stupid. Like, right. it's $100 for a Holiday Inn Express. Like, just go get a hotel. <laughs> and that's why I bought the passenger van with the pop-up on top. Yeah. Because I could drive it to the supermarket, park it in a normal spot. I could ha drive around five people. They could all have seatbelts. I could put stuff in the back. You know, it's awesome when you, you know, it's awesome when you could do that. Like most vans, you open the back door and it's like a bed and you can't fit anything because you're cramming in your bikes and there's a bed on top and like the bed's half ass and the the floors, you know, the bikes are underneath and like you and I are both big dudes. Like yeah. we're not putting size medium bikes under our bed. We're putting size yeah. large and extra large. And like yeah, when and we go to sleep, thing too, it's we like, like want said. a queen size bed, but you know. Right. Like you said, I mean, you're 6'4", I'm 6'2". So, I mean, it's like I can't sleep sideways. Like I have yeah. to build a bed that goes into your like, like head front, you know, or back, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and, uh, that's, you know, those inches are precious inside of those things, you know? And I yeah. was thinking in my head, I don't really want to get the real big one. I would want to get the one, like the 148, the smallest one I could. They could put to, like, in parking spaces. And stuff. Yeah. It'd just be easier to like yeah. drive and whatever, you know? And then down the road, if I like, am like, van life is the life for me, then maybe I, I, you know, buy a bigger one later, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of fill it out. But well, stay uh, tuned and check out my van check video. Yeah. You might be into it. And yeah. those, those rooftop tents, they're expensive, but you know, I think the one I have costs like 3000 bucks, 3,500. It's a hard shell James Burrard tent. Uh -huh. But you're going to spend a shit ton of money building out the inside, too. Like, that's not cheap. That um, lady that, um, what was her name? Uh, Hannah Vanna. Do you, do you ever meet her at the fest? I haven't met her at the fest, but I've seen seen her videos and stuff like that. Yeah. And the pros and cons of the rooftop tent, then we can get off tents because I'm sure yeah, yeah. Uh, vans, I'm sure everybody doesn't want to listen to a van podcast. Or maybe they do. Yeah. But It doesn't the, matter. The, if the, we're the ones on podcast. We get to talk about whatever we want. Yeah. So the pro <laughs> is... For dudes like us, it's a full size queen mattress. Like oh, yeah. I can stretch out and I can put my hand side to side and I have yeah. plenty of room over my head and plenty of room for my feet. Like it's huge. And you're not going to get that inside the van. The downside is I'm not pulling into a Walmart parking lot and boondocking and like right. stealth camping. 
but then I almost feel like vans are so popular nowadays that the days of like stealth camping on a city street and somebody not knowing that you're camping, like everybody knows when they see a van nowadays, you're camping. Yeah. Yeah, so especially a I van with a, reflective stuff in the windows and a freaking right. and a fan on top of the roof. So I was never that guy anyway. When I'm driving, like say if I go to Sedona is a bad example, but a lot of the other festivals, I will drive down to Florida or drive up to Nemba Fest and I'll get a hotel on the way and I will camp at the festival with everybody camping. And then if I need to stop at a hotel on the way too, like I don't. I, I'm not popping the tent at a rest stop. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm just going to go get a hotel. Yeah, but I feel like awesome, I would use mine mostly like for like the, the weekend shit. The thing I was going to say about the Hannah chick was that she had that vent, that tent that was on the roof, but you could like climb through a hole in the roof to get into oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Those hers was cool. pretty rad that way where it was like, then she only had to have the main cabin was like living space or garage kind of thing. Instead yeah. of having it be like, uh, uh, like a sleeping a area too. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. But yeah, I think that's out of like my price range of like what I want to invest in it. Because like I said, I'm not a full time van yeah. camper. You know, if I, I think was, realistically, I if I was to like answer the question right now, I'm fucking get the engine swapped and consider <laughs> like just keep thinking about buying a topper, and then that'll happen for like six more years and <laughs> what year is the, what year is the car the truck is that 2013 but i mean it's a good looking I mean, truck you could I mean, probably get you could probably get 30 40 thousand dollars for that thing anyway so it might just be an investment just get the engine yeah and, i don't know yeah and then sell it down the road and sell it in a year yeah yeah i, mean, hope, I think right now as it is like it. the last thing that i got from like because there's places hitting me up now because it's like those um like trucks are popular for the resale right now and they can't get them because all the oh, yeah. chip problems and shit like that. And uh like uh I think I could get like 20 for that, you know, the way it is. I get more than that. I would yeah. think you get more than that. It's ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. It's a good looking truck though too. I mean it's like that's the thing is like I have it set up the way I mean it's lifted. I got like everything that I mm -hmm. want, you know, is like it's there, you know what I mean? That thing's already put together and I I already spent a bunch of money on it this year getting some suspension stuff done. So it's just like, that's the real kicker. I think if I wouldn't have already spent the money because I, I spent like, first of all, I don't know, you've had a big truck before. Like, it's like two grand to get new tires, right? It's not like going to yeah. put tires on your freaking Ford Fiesta for like, you're out the door for three bills, right? You know, <laughs> like, so... So it was like two grand on that. I had to do redo a bunch of brake shit. That was like a grand. It was like uh, some other crap I got done. Dude, I've spent like eight grand on it this year and just like other like maintenance and like some things that have come up. So I'm kind of feel like I'm in. Like if I didn't spend that money already, if the tires were bald right now and the brakes were needing to be changed, I'd be like, I'm out. This is it. Right. You right, know? Right. Yeah. But hey, you ever I have anybody take a uh, break in the middle of a podcast? You, you gotta go. You gotta go to the bathroom or something. I, no, I need to go get another uh, hard seltzer. Oh, you can. Oh well, I can talk about your hard seltzer while you're gone, dude. Go All for right, it, hold man. on. I'll be so, right back. I'll just rant about the truck. So this is the deal. Somebody's ask, asking in the in the uh, questions that my what engine my truck is, and it's the uh, the V6 twin turbo one. So I really feel like slapping the new motor in it. Is probably the best thing to do. I'm assuming that that I mean, if I go through, yes, I could get it done by somebody cheaper, I'm sure. But I'm thinking that if I get it done at the at the dealership, that there would be like a pretty decent warranty. I don't know if that warranty, like, do you guys, any of you guys out there work for a freaking car company or something like that? Why does it sound like crickets right now? You guys hear that? I'm going to grab it. I'm going to grab a seltzer, and it's in my van outside. So the, the it really is cricket. What is? Oh, it's your <laughs> your your microphones are actually picked. Oh, yeah, like, I had to go shit. outside to go get a. Uh, I was like, why is this happening? I thought I was losing <laughs> my fucking mind for a minute, and the fact that oh, that's great. So, anyways, okay. so those of you guys that are that work at a dealership or something like that, if you're in the chat, I don't know. Like, I would assume you get like thirty six thousand mile warranty out of it or something, right? It's got to be like a brand new engine, right? So, oh, look at that. Oh, it's got the little California bear on it. 
So Jeff this just showed back up with the hard seltzer. Artisan hard seltzer. Remember I said I got, I just got this uh, Dometic refrigerator inside my van. It's the best thing I ever, it was like my biggest splurge. Uh-huh. That's the best thing I ever bought. Really? I mean, it's cool. Like, obviously it's cool when you finish a ride to have beer, but like on a daily basis to have a cold, like normal seltzer or when you go to for a ride and you have a cold water bottle, like yeah. I was, I finally got a Yeti cooler a few years ago. And I thought that uh-huh. was cool, uh-huh. but then having a refrigerator is like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. It's like next level. Yeah, it's like unbelievable. I feel like if I had a refrigerator full of beer at the bottom of the trail, there's the reason <laughs> that I would definitely need the van because I'd be like, well, it's either DUI or sleep here tonight. <laughs> yeah, totally right. So that would definitely be an easy, easy decision for me there. So that was really weird, dude. I was like, why? Yeah, you heard I the crickets. Here? freaking crickets but i wasn't yeah, thinking of your microphone you're wearing the air airpods do you even have crickets in california we do but i i don't think they, they don't come much, out right? much yeah they only they only come out for like social services and stuff like that so dude right <laughs> now it's like out of control the crickets and uh i was in florida in may with my friend lance who's in like i put in a bunch of my youtube videos and stuff like that uh-huh. um and it was cicada season Oh, those things are hella loud. <laughs> Dude, we made like, I tried to make all these how-to videos and we couldn't even use them. The audio is completely unusable because there's like so many cicadas. Oh, wow. It was insane. Yeah. So we I, were like, all right, I guess we got to do that another time. I lived at this house at one one point in my life and out back there was uh, like a little, it was probably supposed to be a koi pond, but it turned into like a frog pond. And like there was... I, I don't know how those things breed. If they breed like like freaking, I would imagine they 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 have a lot of of offspring all at once. And um, that thing, like you would go outside, and it sounded like like you were standing next to a waterfall of of uh, frogs. They were like so loud, all of them ribbiting. Like really? they would just be like ribbit, ribbit. You know, but it was so many, so loud. Like it was freaking like like a like a Harley Davidson of frogs were riding by when you walk, open up your door. And I would walk outside and I would just be like silence, and they'd all shut up. And it just made me feel like so good to do that. And then like like thirty seconds later, one would be like ribbit, and then another one. And next thing you know, brrr, whole whole freaking orchestra of frogs came back. But that was just like the highlight of my night to walk out and just be like. <laughs> Like I was in control of the situation. Really, I wasn't. Silo. So, <laughs> so hard Probably seltzer, huh? Kind of... Probably the only. Yeah. It... How, how'd like that happen? Nice, sweet... no, it's like a I nice don't feel like did did taste. like is, is there like a contract negotiation in your read thing that like they said something about like you're no, not they allowed, would allowed to wear some, like they would, skinny they would jeans make fun and of me. drink seltzer. <laughs> All the Reed guys would probably make fun of me, yeah, if they saw me drinking seltzer. Um, it's actually my friend Lance, the guy that I put in all my videos. Uh-huh. Um, he's a big seltzer guy, and I was, you know, I it's can't Labor Day weekend. Stuff. It's Labor Day weekend, so obviously, come on, give me a break. Right, having having a few beers earlier, and I figured I should settle it down for the biker podcast. Oh, so no, I figured dude, the seltzer big, was a man. little bit of a cleaner burn. You should have came up with a dipa or a, like a, a triple IPA. I would have been like, oh, this is this is where it's at now, man. We're going to get the dirt. Dude, we did um, a uh, read podcast. So Adam, who you had on. Uh-huh. Uh, Tim, who you had on. And then Steve, the Space Cowboy. That's his nickname. Uh-huh. He's our suspension designer. Um so it was a podcast on my channel or not a podcast, just a live stream Yeah, yeah. Um, on my channel with those three. And it was the first one we ever did. It was the beginning of COVID last year uh-huh. and we all got freaking hammered. <laughs> it turned into like a three and a half hour, like just bullshit session. Uh-huh. And it was like, it was really funny. Like everybody, like you could just tell it was probably like, two or three months after COVID hit and you could just tell like everybody was like so bottled up for human interaction right, 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 right. and whatever. And like, we all just got hammered on the podcast. That was pretty awesome. That's fun. I did that right around that same time too. Uh, a bunch of the guys I was in the army with, we all got on one night and like, uh, did like a big Skype fucking thing or something like that. And just sat around. It was like, we were, it was like we were at the bar except we were all like at our houses just 
like two and a half hours later doing shots and shit. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Yep, I'm hammered awesome. by myself on the internet. You're like virtual shot. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, this is the world today. Who would have thought, man? Like, I, I thought by this point, if you would have told me at the beginning that it would be September of 2021 and we'd still be kind of like meandering through this thing, I wouldn't have believed it. I would not I have believed wouldn't. it either. It's it's like, it's pretty insane. Yeah, and it kind of seems like this like Delta variant thing is going to like Dude. do a little backpedal for a minute before we Delta like, variant is to... a real bitch. <laughs> yeah. I it really is like just... those memes you see with Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding, like right? my fall plans, the Delta variant. Right? Yeah, yeah, no Just brainer. Home. Leave us alone. Right? Yeah. But I don't know, man. If things that, do you think there's gonna be like a huge surge in used bikes next next year? They start opening um, up. Um I mean, it's awesome that people are experiencing the outdoors. Yeah. Um I don't know. I don't think there's gonna be like a huge surge in used used bikes because I think that cycling is a fun activity. It's just getting people to to use them. If anything, I would think that there'd probably be like a bigger surge in like uh, maybe niche bikes, like a, say a downhill bike or something like that versus just uh, like cycling, you know, like maybe some, COVID hits and somebody's like, I'm going to get into downhill mountain biking or, or like road biking. But I don't think you're going to see like people selling commuter bikes or like general cross country bikes, like just mountain bikes, thinking, you know, things like I that. Think what, Maybe, maybe, maybe I didn't like phrase that right. Like I was thinking that come next spring, things start lightening up and all these people that bought these bikes that maybe aren't ready to fully commit to like being a, a cyclist for the rest of their life, going to start dumping the bikes that they bought for COVID. Right. So that's, that's what I meant. I think that maybe the people that have like the visions of grandeur, uh -huh. you know, like I'm going to get into like the stretch goals, like downhilling or like yeah. real niche things, but but cycling's fun. I wonder, like, I, I've thought about that a lot too. I wonder, like, if you bought if you bought a commuter bike because you needed an activity you could do outdoors with your friends, not inside, instead of yeah. your gym. I don't know. That, that's still like pretty fun. But maybe like something that takes more effort, like getting to the downhill park every weekend, like which is you know a lot harder than just walking out your front door and hopping on your bike, or things like that. Maybe those might fall off a little bit more than. The ones that are more convenient because you know obviously but, like we're i don't all know, i think it, have it yeah but i look at it like like yes i totally agree with you riding riding mountain bikes freaking fun right so but like even as it is pre-covid let's just say out of 10 people that go out and buy a new bike like two of those people it sits in the garage and collects dust and then after like three years they try to sell it for the same price that they've bought it for right right right. and they're like oh it's only been written twice and I'm like yeah but it's two years old dude i don't don't get right. shit. you know like nowadays um, it's I, like i've only written it twice i only want six hundred dollars more than i paid for it right <laughs> yeah exactly like steal. right now yeah but um i feel like you know so like that's there's going to be that same number of people that got th that decided to try to get into biking that didn't actually get into biking you know what I mean? And maybe they went riding with their friends a few times, or maybe they didn't get into it until right when COVID was kind of wrapping up and now they can go back to the gym or whatever. And I feel like, I feel like there's a bunch of those people out there. I don't know though, man, it's hard to say because, because of COVID I'm like contradicting myself, but because of COVID it's like, there was all these supply issues. So maybe a lot of the bikes that did get bought were really like people that were actually really into biking, just trying to get a new bike already, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that we saw a huge spike for people looking to do activities that don't require being inside because obviously that was kind of like a no go. Yeah, yeah. Last year, last year a lot, and this year kind of the same. But I mean, even if that rises the tide a little bit, it's still great yeah. for the industry. It's good to have new people into the sport. Um, you know, new people into the sport help make better trails, help make you know better yeah. events stuff like that so hopefully so it has I was a positive you, impact do you, do you do much like trials riding still like i mean most of the stuff that i see on your youtube is like i mean you'll you'll bounce around on some stuff trying to like get through some 
technical stuff, but I mean, do you actually go out and like try to jump on top, like handrails and shit like that back in the day or? No, I don't really do that stuff too much anymore. I, I recently, well, not recently, last year, I got a custom trials bike made from Reeb. That was a 27.5 trials bike. Uh huh. So it's, so it's almost like a mount. It's almost like a regular mountain bike. But right, it's, right. It's my trials bike. It's cool because Ryan Leach just bought one and we sold a few other ones. Um, I definitely still really enjoy technical riding. I still enjoy sessioning. Uh-huh. But I probably don't go out and urban trials ride as much as I should. Or I, mean, I, still, I always have the intention. I always say I want to go do it. Uh-huh. Um, but then I just don't go do it. But then it gets complicated because then I have like my signature bike from Reeb is called the Ridiculous. And it's such a switchblade of a bike nowadays. Mm-hmm. Ten years ago, you had to either go out on your trail bike or your trials bike. You had to make that call because they weren't as good for one thing or the other. Right. And like I can go out and session on my trials bike, probably riding like what was a trials course 10 years ago uh-huh. and then go take it to Mountain Creek bike park and ride downhill. You yeah, know, obviously yeah. on a hardtail. So it's not like, you know, you ride it differently than a suspension bike, but like the bikes are so versatile nowadays. It's hard to say, but I, but no, I don't, I don't ride like specific trials nearly as much yeah. as I used to. Right on, man. I was wondering, yeah. I wasn't sure, like, like I was thinking, I um, put my name on a, on a list or whatever. I paid the down payment or something to get a, um, a dirt jumper. Okay. Cause I was like thinking that that would be fun to do. And I was thinking I could ride that a little bit more urban too. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm just I mean, like, that's, go ahead. The bikes that I always rode were dirt jump bikes for trials. So you can yeah. totally like go out and have fun with that. And I think that that's. For the average mountain biker, that's a better way to go than a specific trials bike nowadays because specific trials bikes need to be ridden a very specific way. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like you, they're not really, they don't translate over to a regular mountain bike as much as you, as a normal dirt jumper would. Right. So if you got a dirt jumper and put a front brake on it and went and screwed around with like trials, these type stuff, and it went to the pump track and you know, the local bike park or whatever, like that stuff would translate over to your 27.5 or your 29 mountain right. bike better than a modern day trials bike. If yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Yeah. Just modern the way that the geometry bike. is and stuff. Yeah, exactly. A modern day trials bike is designed to be ridden on the back wheel. Yeah. Like if when you design a mountain bike, they design it with two bikes on the ground, horizontal, and like yeah, your anatomy wheels, yeah, points, yeah. your anatomy yeah, yeah. points all connect for there. And like a, a modern day trials bike, I I swear they must like design in CAD with like the front wheel in the air and then connect all the dots where your anatomy points would would reach. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't possibly. doesn't really translate, but but it's also why those guys do like literally the most amazing things that I never even remotely thought was possible like on competition yeah. trials like so it's cool to see but it doesn't really translate that much yeah like when you see somebody like like danny max skill or whatever like does that blow your mind like from like what you would have thought like like 20 year old jeff would have, would have thought it's it, i mean it's it's literally i have this conversation often like it's all perception like when i first started mountain biking well, like when Ryan Leach and I first started mountain biking, like street trials didn't exist. So we would look at trials and we would look at BMX freestyle and stuff. And we would try to like take that influence and we would sort of make mountain urban mountain biking. And really the whole urban mountain bike thing started because there was like a slew of mountain bike trials videos back in the day. And for competitive trials riders, like, natural trials riding always was the benchmark like we all knew that that was the hardest riding you could do was natural riding because everything is organic and it's there's nothing angular there's no like there's no there's like very little grip there could be moss there could be dirt dust whatever right you ride a set of stairs the stairs geometric it's like they're flat stairs they're easy relatively easy to ride versus like a set of rocks or whatever so we mm-hmm. all knew like riding natural terrain was the hardest, but then this was like VHS days. 
we started filming for mountain bike trials videos and you'd go and do like something super hard on natural terrain and it just didn't look that hard. It's like the GoPro effect before GoPros even existed. You're like, oh man, I did like the hardest line. I rode down this log and then I bunny hopped a four foot yeah, yeah. rock and whatever. And you just look at it and you're like, that doesn't look that hard. And then you would film a video line of like riding down some stair steps and hopping over a picnic table. And the average person would be like, oh shit, like that looks really hard because they all, everybody knows kind of like how hard high a handrail is and how high a picnic right. table is. Like you have that because you live in an everyday life. Yeah, that so, totally makes sense what you're saying. There's like something to like under, like to be able to like conceptualize there. Like if you it's, jump, it's, if you bunny hop over a picnic table, they're like, oh wow, that's a freaking picnic table. Right. But they so, don't know how big that rock was. Right. So it, without getting off topic, when I make my trail boss videos now, the best thing that could possibly happen is when somebody comments, Oh, I've ridden that trail before and it's impossible because you need that person to validate it. Cause when you watch everything on go like yeah. a video nowadays, everything looks easy. I'll sit there and watch the Red Bull rampage and think like, yeah. Oh shit, I could do that. And like, there's literally <laughs> no way on earth I could ever do that. Like right, not, right, there's right. not a chance that I could ever do that. But if I watch right. it on TV, I'm like, Oh, I can do that. You yeah, can't do yeah. that. So like right myself, Brian, uh, myself, Martin Ashton, who probably a lot of your viewers know from GMBN, Global Mountain Bike Network, uh, uh -huh. and then another English guy, Martin Hawes, like we were kind of the pioneers of urban trials riding, but it wasn't like, we, we just did it. Like it wasn't like, oh, let's invent this. Like we just did it to do it. We started yeah, you're just videos. Riding, riding bikes, dude, and having fun. Right, and I was like, like, I just graduated college. Like, it was way easier for me to go ride around my college campus than it was to go find rocks. So, 100%. It was something we always did, but it wasn't anything that was ever represented. Hans Ray was doing it a little bit, but he wasn't really doing a ton of urban stuff. He still was, like, doing a lot of natural stuff, and he was, like, obviously our, the big influence. But Ryan and myself and Martin Ashton and Martin Hawes kind of were the guys who, like, really started street riding mm -hmm. urban urban free riding urban trials whatever and then there there was like all the early vhs tapes and the dvds of you know it would always be guys hucking off cliffs flipping over their handlebars and then it would go to like a rap song and ryan would have his urban trial section and that would be the crank series and it would be new world disorder would be like guys hucking off massive cliffs that like nowadays are pedestrian but it's crazy because you just had to have somebody do that first. Yeah. Like Josh Bender did stuff that like we thought was absolutely insane. And now guys like Cam Zink and Ethan Nell and like, it's just like a normal rampage run. But 20 years ago it was like, it was like going to the moon. Like it was totally right. going to the moon. So there would yeah, be the yeah. general disorder. Be, it would be all that stuff. And then it would be like, cue the rap song. And then Jeff comes in and does the urban free ride segment. <laughs> it was just funny, like how, like, so stereotypical now. It's like urban rap, uh, Metallica, Darren Bearclaw, you know? Right, right, yeah. Um, In the woods, heavy metal. You know, on the street, rap. <laughs> right, totally, yeah. And, um, but we just did it. And then, like, to see what it's, you know, it's a combination of, like, the sport evolving. Like, when, when we started riding, like, we thought a lot of stuff was impossible. I yeah. remember like when I started to gravitate more towards uh, a little bit away from trials to street riding, like we all thought it was impossible to do a bar spin on a mountain bike. And then I was like one of the first guys that was like got pretty proficient at bar spins and like was able to like incorporate them in trials riding and stuff. But then we all thought tail whips were impossible. Like I remember it was like, oh, you can't tail with a mountain bike too big. And then like Darren Bearclaw was the first guy that started proficiently tail whipping mountain bikes. And it's like, oh yeah, but he has a 24 inch back wheel. Of course, that's why I could do it. And then uh, somebody, yeah. then somebody tail whips a mount, like a full size mountain bike, like Rat Rider Casprick, and all these dudes who are doing like all these tail whips. But like, we always thought that was impossible. But then kids getting into the sport at that moment in time get into this, get into the sport, and they're like, okay, this is the starting line. You yeah. tail whip a mountain bike, you bar spin a mountain bike, yeah. you 360 a mountain bike, and then it just keeps going from there. So like dudes getting into it now, look at Danny and they're like, that's the benchmark. <laughs> like, right. That's where I start. I start dropping right. off 20 foot high buildings and riding down handrails and whatever. 
it's just crazy the evolution it's like a it's like a combination it's probably mostly mental yeah i think that's a huge part is like just breaking down those barriers but then it's like it's, i'd say it's 50 percent mental it's 25 percent like just being better athletes or like just human yeah. evolution and probably it's definitely 25 percent bike evolution too because everybody now you know, you can watch Danny, you can watch the hardcore trials guy, you can watch the Red Bull Rampage. And you're just like, holy crap, how do they do that? But they're all riding bikes that are made specifically for that thing. Yeah. And that helps as well. You know, like we rode. Yeah, that's a big difference. I, I, mean, rode, I, a just, dirt, I rode a dirt jumper, you know. I, I rode a dirt yeah. jumper my whole life. Yeah. They're riding like custom made trials bikes specifically made for that. I know the trails that we rode in the 90s, like compared to what we ride now like i would have never thought like like for instance trail that i worked on building last year there's a section through there that's like stupid steep and rocky right if if you would have put me on the top of that trail in the 90s i would have been like there is absolutely no way you could ride a bike down this like zero way like it wouldn't even be like a thought of like hey let's try to ride down this you, you know what i mean it would just be like Oh, well, this is a hiking trail, you know? Like. Yeah. yeah. There's a few things that play there. So one thing that I think is interesting is when I first started mountain biking, which was like literally 30 years ago, I always thought like trail erosion and stuff like that was bullshit. Dude, you just, and now like me right there, dude, that is like 1000% a real thing. And I feel like the bike evolution, <laughs> like I ride a trail that I rode 20 years ago and I'm like, sweet, I can still ride that trail. But in reality, I probably never, ever, ever could have ridden that trail on the bike that I rode 20 years ago. It's just that the yeah. bikes are so good, it makes up for the trail erosion yeah. nowadays. But then the other insane thing is, it's crazy. Greg Menard just won the world championship. That dude is unbelievable. I don't understand how he can continue doing what he does. But you watch like old videos of him riding his 26-inch mountain bike like when he was on Honda and yeah. orange before that the riding styles completely acts are so different like it's absolutely insane what you could do on these bikes now so yeah you, like how you're saying you're building a trail you could never ride down like downhill mountain bike tracks now are absolutely insane i don't think the average person realizes how steep they are because nothing looks hard on tv or youtube you know yeah. on your phone yeah. or computer or tv it all looks yeah. so easy if you're watching a video insane. and it looks and it looks hard, it's really bad. <laughs> like, exactly. like unbelievably bad. Exactly. Like anybody that has a GoPro that has gone out and ridden their local trail that they're like, this is sick. They know exactly what we're talking about. Because you get home and it's like, wah, wah, wah. You look at that video and you're like, this, this is nothing looks cool about this. Like nothing looks cool about this. I've always joked like they don't they don't do it as much so much anymore, but I always thought it was funny like when you would like I've walked in like ten years ago or something when GoPros were really popular. Like I've walked into Walmarts and stuff like that. And and I remember in Vail, Colorado, I did this. I walked into a Walmart and they had this whole display set up where it was like a GoPro tent with this huge monitor playing like Aaron Chase and Darren Bearcon, like the most, and Travis Rice, like the most beautiful GoPro shots ever under a tent inside a Walmart with like their, you know, on a huge monitor and like a stack of cases of Red Bull on one side, like the most cliche thing you could ever imagine. Stack of cases right. of Monster on the other. And it's like every person probably walks in there and they're like, I'm going to make that video. Yeah. And then they go out and they get the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, well, shit, it doesn't look anything like that. No. I've been editing for like three, four years now. I think it's now four years almost. And um, I'm still not at that level. Like, I'm not like a bad editor, but that dude, those, those people that are like fucking legit, like video editors, they could yeah. make like, they could make like a potato cam look good. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, it's and hard then to outside make of that, look good and yeah, it's tough. But, it's really tough. Yeah, it's a lot of work, man. It's definitely a lot. I mean, we've had this conversation before. Like, 
YouTube is definitely way harder than you would think by watching it, you know? Yeah. I think it's interesting now, too. You're starting to see, like, some of these bigger channels that have, like, maybe been around since the beginning of this, like, let's just call it, like, the BKXC boom, you know? Yeah. Like, you're seeing people drop off. and, And it's not because, like, they weren't successful. You're seeing them drop off because it, it's fucking hard work, man. Yeah. And there's this thing with it too that is like it's this like heavy amount of like stress that you like self-imposed stress that you put on yourself that is like something that you don't even like you can't really put words to. You know, it's like how much stress you put on your like release schedule and how much stress you put on like your thumbnail being perfect and this and that and the other and like your edit or your music and then you're and you're just constantly like judging yourself against everybody around you you know yeah. and you're it, it is it's a it's i mean what's your perspective let's hear it i've seen a huge attrition is that the right word of sounds like, about right i'm in you know f- fall off of just like, yeah like i remember I think I've been YouTubing four years now or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You started right um, around when I did like 2017, 2018, something like that. Yeah, I think so. And and yeah. like when I first started, it was just, I didn't intend to start a YouTube channel. I started to, I intended to start a video series with Pink Bike that would, and ho- YouTube was just going to be the place to host my videos. Yeah. And I was just going to do six a year. And I thought I'd do six a year. The first year I did six videos. The second year I did, I think I started with like that schedule of six or something like that, or maybe Uh eight. And then I was like, well, shit, I got to do more than this. I got to do more, more frequent videos. So then I was like, oh, you know what? I'll do some ride along videos and stuff like that. Less produced things and whatever. Yeah. And, um, but you were always editing your stuff, right? Well, the trail boss features, I had somebody editing for me and then all the other stuff. I, yeah. And then I had, Because I came into it, like, honestly, like, I came into it from the worst perspective possible. I, like, I came into it riding in those New World Disorder videos where there were literally 10 guys riding in in these videos. Like, you were handpicked. There were 10 guys in a video. And it was either New World Disorder from one video production company or Cranked. And every single bike shop in the world bought Cranked or New World Disorder. So I came into it like completely delusional. I was like, oh, well, that's like I I came into it from that thinking like you earned your spot. And then that's just what everybody watched because that's the only thing you can buy, you know? Yeah. So like when yeah, I, I remember you telling YouTube me when videos, you first started. I'm like, yeah, like everybody's going to watch the Lenoski video. And then you're like, well, shit, Robert's 10 times more entertaining. Not Not <laughs> just about the writing. It's like the whole package. And you're like okay, like it took me a while to get my feet underneath me and I'm still not great at it at all because I, I just do what I like to do. Like I well, you're doing something right, dude, because I'm over here with. at like 14,000 subscribers and you're at like 70. I know, but there's, you know, then there's people with half a million, two million, whatever. But yeah. like, I want to ride with my friends that are my actual friends. I don't want to worry. Like, I don't care if it's a collaboration. Like, yeah. My friend Lance doesn't have a YouTube channel. He's my best friend. That's who I ride with all the time. I'm going to put right. him in my videos. Yeah, yeah. Not very self-serving. Yeah. That's who I want to ride with. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, 100%. I enjoy doing how-tos and riding tech trails. But for me, I think it's a little bit different because um, when I first started riding, it was always about mountain bike trials demos. So I, I enjoyed competing at trials, and that was always super fun. But I always looked at the trials competitions as the starting line and a lot of people looked at the trials competitions as the finish line so what i mean by that is i was like the first american guy to get sponsored for trials fortunately one year like i went in 93 i was lucky enough to win a national championship but 94 95 96 like i didn't win i was second place third place whatever like overall and there would be guys i'm friends with that would beat me and like, I know that even though they're your friends, there's like a little resentment, like, 
Well, why yeah. is he sponsored? I should be sponsored. But yeah. when I was writing for Schwinn, I would do like literally 150 demos a year. I would go to every single bike shop, every mountain bike festival, whatever, because I would I would do the competition and then think, all right, now it's time to like do the competition. You validated yourself. Now go to every bike shop and be like, hey, have me come to your grand opening. I'm yeah, national yeah. champion or I'm no, national number two or whatever. Right. So that was always like my DNA. Like you compete, but like nobody cares about trials. Like I, I understand that. Like I wasn't stupid. But they do care if you could like do an entertaining show and come do a live demo and whatever. So that's literally the first 15 years of my career was competing, but doing those shows, making those videos, but doing those shows. So when YouTube happened, it was like an extension of that. It was like the same thing. Like, I just want people to see my writing. I want people to get excited about writing. I want people to have fun. I want to inspire people. I want people to like either be like, that was super fun. I want to ride bikes or I'm going to go jog or whatever. Like just get psyched about something. But it was always about like using your riding to then do something with it. So a lot of my colleagues from back in the day, not trials, but other disciplines, downhill, cross country, like none of those guys from the, or girls from the nineties or two thousands, like they're not doing YouTube. Cause if yeah. you're, if you're just, racing world cup downhills and winning like it's not in your dna to go make a youtube channel like yeah, why would you do like, that? why do you need to like you're already like it's just not a money. currency What's that it's not a currency that you ever trade in like right that all those sports are built were predicated upon like you race a you race a world cup downhill and then all the media happens like you just win and the media happens like you don't have to do that you know what i mean like yeah, if you win a if you win a World Cup, you're gonna get pictures in a magazine. Yeah, yeah. Later on, you're gonna get in a video. Whatever. Right. All you have to do is win. But with trials, it was never like that. Like you could win all the competitions in the world, but unless you got off your ass and like booked a trials demo or something, like nobody <laughs> like literally nobody cares. Like yeah. you had to do something with it. You had to take some initiative. What do you think what so, do you think changed with that to like make somebody like Danny Maxkill like become you know, world renowned, you know, like why, why do you um, think that changed just because like they finally like maybe started doing urban shit that, that was like off the wall enough that you, that people actually were like, Oh wow, that's sick. So, so I honestly, like I probably have told this to other people in the past, but like the, the, so my challenge, obviously Danny was coming up and there was nothing stopping him. Like, the dude's amazing. But uh -huh. my last year, so the problem for me, like I used to film for New World Disorder and I was right. like in that system and it was like, you would have a filmer give you one week to come out and shoot. So if you look at, if you follow the New World Disorder series, like two, three, four, five, six, I would go to France for a week or Germany for a week. And I would usually go with Aaron Chase or somebody else. And we would have like one week to ride around Barcelona, find the best stuff we could possibly find, make right. a video segment and call it a day, you know? Right. And then the last two years, the level of writing, like that's when YouTube was starting to get popular. Right. So the level of writing was already starting to get high. So if you look at the last two years of New World Disorder, I filmed them all around New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, all places I could like film out, scout out, have stuff like ready to go because rolling into Barcelona and like hoping you find stuff in a week just wasn't cutting it anymore. Right. Like that just didn't, it just wasn't realistic. And then you get put in this video that goes to literally every single bike shop in the world. Right. And like, if that's your representation of yourself, it's not a good representation of yourself. Okay. And the other thing was like, as a trials rider, like, I always had a good spot in those videos, but I definitely didn't have like, I wasn't like a, a Brandon Seminock or a cam a call where like they might get two or three weeks or yeah. whatever, or, or three trips. Like I got one trip. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to make the most of it. So the last two videos I filmed for, for new world disorder were like literally in my back. Like a lot of them were in my backyard where I could build stuff for that or all around New Jersey. Like, Anybody who knows me, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I was like literally 20 minutes from your house or five minutes right. from your and house. I, like, 
I would yeah. scout all that stuff out. So but maybe not, maybe not you specifically. Maybe you're getting to this, and I'm just cutting you off or something. But, yeah, I'm gonna right. get to it. Yeah, I'll get okay. To that. So the level of riding started to get so high that like it was, I think it was like 2009 or 10 or whatever. Like I filmed my last New World Disorder segment. Like I filmed a backflip on like a, a first ever like backflip on street and like all these tricks I wanted to do. And right. whatever. I was like, I don't know if I could do that again. And then like Danny comes out with his first video. That was like a viral sensation that he took like a year to film. Right. And I'm right. like, I can't compete with that. Like you can't compete with somebody who's taken a year to film a video. And like you have one week. Yeah. And it just, it was just this paradigm shift. Like the big video didn't matter anymore. And it's not better or worse. Like it just didn't matter. It's the same thing with music. Yeah. Like, you know, you used to have your studio album and you're, like, it just didn't matter. The walls came down where like, and it was like, you know, for all the athletes in that generation, I'm sure it was hard to, to swallow. And some adapted like Cam McCall and Cam Zink. They're doing YouTube channels, Eric Porter. Like we adapted and we, and we like it at first though. It's hard. You know, like you're like, right. well, shit, I was a gatekeeper. Like I was one of 10 guys and now like anybody could do this. Right. And, and if you're willing to adapt, you know, you could do, do good for yourself. But like it was, it was the fact that the thing that helped Danny was it didn't matter anymore. Like you didn't have to be sponsored by Mavic or Bell Helmets to get in a video. Everybody had the same opportunity on YouTube. And that's why guys like Danny, who were the best, just rose to the top. There wasn't so you think, somebody you, there you like you feel like YouTube is what changed it then. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. If it during that era, if it continued for another ten years the way it was the guys in those videos were the best, but they were also the guys that were like, it was, it was, you were sponsored because you were the best, but you were in the videos because you were the best. Right. If that makes any sense. So like, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. I, I, the very first year I got a new world disorder, it was because I was like in, when I was on Schwinn, it was because I was sponsored by bell helmets mm -hmm. because they would, they would say like, Hey, new world disorder, here's a hundred thousand dollars, but we want, Brandon Semenuk, Jeff Lenoski, and Aaron Chase in the video. Like, they'd right. buy your section. And right, if you right. suck, you would lose that spot. Right. But like, you eventually you earn it. Eventually you earn it, and then it's like, oh, well, now now Jeff is riding for Mavic, Bell, Fox. Of course he needs, like, he's got his spot. And you right. earn that spot. And then, and then this new platform comes up where it's like, anybody has the same accessibility to the public right. as you do. And that's why the guys that are awesome, like Danny, like, it's, yeah, because before the, that, the like, you, couldn't, you couldn't be freaking fat Robert and Auburn all of a sudden having an audience, you know, like, <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? Like, like you, you couldn't make a fucking video at home, even if you were a badass editor and put it out to, you know, the world prior, like, yeah, prior no way to do that. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's like you you have to go to a magazine. The editor is going to say, right, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, I don't, dude, know, I don't know who Robert is, you know. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about this my bad, friend dude. and whatever. Yeah, YouTube yeah. changed all that, and I and yeah. I and now I think it's it's a good thing. I, I like yeah. it. Like, you know, I'm really interested in like what becomes like the YouTube like like competitor. You, you know what I mean? Like, I really question that. Like there's Instagram and TikTok out there and, and they're trying, but they're really not the YouTube competitor. Like they're right. Right. They're, they're, they really have it dialed on this like short thing, you know, like shorts, like little clips and stuff like that. I feel like that that's really it. And maybe Instagram does maybe in the long run or something like that. I don't know, but there's not really a platform that is like longer format, like as, like right now, YouTube is they're they're the they're the big gorilla in the room. There's nobody else doing that. Like VBO doesn't do it like YouTube does. You know what I mean? Like nobody right, right. They're, they're and 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 we all know, like, look at history or look at anything where there's one person doing it successfully, somebody else is gonna do it too. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, like there there's no way that like the capitalist freaking economy of America is gonna be like, oh, we'll just let that guy have all the money. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
So I'm like really Yeah, and curious. then that's like that's also interesting because then it's like there's there's I've had people say like well what would you do if YouTube went away? And like for me it would suck if it went away, but yeah. I can go do a group ride tomorrow and represent the same thing you see on YouTube yeah. in a group ride and have fun with people. Yeah. And there are some people that rely on YouTube. I don't know. Like, it's just different. Like, but I have seen, but like that being said, I have seen a huge attrition of people that like got into YouTube. They were stoked on like that rise. And then they see the grind and they're like, screw it. I'm out. And yeah. it's a grind for me sometimes. And I have been outsourcing some videos and stuff like that. And sometimes it's a pain in the butt, but like, I just love riding bikes and I just want to share that stoke with people. So like, yeah. I'll keep doing it. <laughs> but like, if you're not, if your heart's not a hundred percent in it, I could see why people are like, I'm out. Yeah, no, man. I, I mean, I, I definitely get it. And like, and, and it's like, I mean, fortunately you're a sponsored rider. So you're, you're, you're getting paid to be, to ride bikes still. Right. You know, and where, yeah. where somebody like me, the YouTube thing is like, I'm making some money. But I'm I'm definitely not paying a house payment or a car payment with it, you, you know what I mean? So yeah. like to to be doing that and like for a, a significant amount significant amount of time, it's definitely something where you're like, I don't know if this is worth it, you know? Like you have to have the passion. Yeah, you know? I need another seltzer. I'll be right yeah, back. Go for it, man. I I, I can <laughs> I can ramble whenever you're ready, dude. I know you could. So, right. So like here, you know, and this is the deal for me. It's like, like at this point, I've been doing it for almost four years at this point. And, um, obviously something's up with the channel where I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not blowing up the subscribers. So I don't know what it is. Maybe I make shitty content. Maybe I'm too, uh, too much of a, too, I cuss too much. Maybe I just don't have the right demographic. I don't know what it is, but at the end of the day, like I'm doing this cause I enjoy it. And, um, who knows, maybe someday, someday it works out. And I'm the, I'm the guy that was like, yeah, that dude's been doing that podcast thing for 10 years. And all of a sudden, boom, it is something, but something I was thinking about the other day was like, what if, what if I do it that long? And then by the time that opportunity comes, I'm like, Okay, well, I'm, I'm not feeling it anymore, you know? So, right now, I really enjoy making videos. I really enjoy the creative process. I would love to be a full-time YouTuber. So, if you guys want to help me out with that, freaking go to Patreon. Um, if you don't want to help me out with that, just hit the subscribe button or the like button or whatever. But um, Would you really want to be a full-time YouTuber? Yes. You know who I think but is killing it now? And it's Who's really that? awesome to see Bobo. Yeah. Yeah. He found his niche. Like he's changed his format to something that like he really loves doing. Yeah. And he's doing awesome. I love seeing it. I've, I've been saying that since he started. I, I remember, I don't even remember if I said it to him. I'm sure I said it to him in person. Cause I freaking don't have a filter, but I, I remember you like him in person. No, not in person, but like, you know, on a he's Slack a call or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. Like it. But like, I remember thinking at the very beginning, like this guy's sketch videos are freaking hilarious. Anytime that he yeah, does he like, like a, a regular video, like, like the videos. rest of us, it's like, dude, yeah, you're just like the rest of us. Huh? He's too talented for that. Like yeah, what he's doing now is what he, what he was meant to do. It's awesome. A hundred percent, a hundred percent what he, what he should be doing. I'm super happy for him, man. I'm just looking for that. Like, uh. I'm looking for that that niche, you know what I mean? I, I think that the podcast here is probably my best niche. I'm just good at talking, man. I'm good at having a conversation with people and making people feel comfortable. I mean, you were supposed to leave like 20 minutes ago. And we're still talking. I know, and then, yeah. You do do a good <laughs> job. Like, I watch your Alan Lynn thing, and like, just, I, I, I'm i guessing it's like, you know, you, you interview people someplace that are totally outside your wheelhouse, and you all answer ask awesome questions and stuff. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just inquisitive. I mean, that's really what it is. You know what I mean? I just say whatever I'm thinking about, you know, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe to me, but it I seems think that's easy. important. Yeah. I think that's super important because sometimes 
you know, you get people that are too invested into it. And yeah. they think like, oh, everybody knows the answer. Like if, if I know the answer to a question, I just think everybody does. Oh, I and they don't. That. And you ask questions that are like really good. Like it's awesome. Like I love yeah, listening yeah. to your podcast with those people. I think for me, it's just. I do you listen know, to all I, your podcasts, by the way. Oh, I appreciate it, dude. Yeah. I'm, that, that makes me happy, man. It's awesome to like, you know, you don't get to put a face to your, your subscribers, you know? So when you get to like, that's always fun. And then to somebody that you respect as well, like, I mean, you're, you're killing on your channel, man. Like, Thanks. like, so it feels good to like have that, you know, that those, those kudos, but uh, like, like I was saying while you were walking away, like, I think, yes, I would like to be a full-time YouTuber, but I feel like because it's taking me so long to like get to that spot, let's just say that I've really like learned how to do it with a good like work-life balance. So like, it wouldn't be like tomorrow I quit my job and now all of a sudden I'm gonna make videos three times a week. It's like, no, I'll keep doing what I'm doing except for I don't have to fucking do my job too. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's tough though, man. It, it's, it's, uh, there's another question too kind of comes to mind you're like what what point do i get too old for this like when am i not interesting to like people anymore yeah you, you know dude, I, mean? I, I mean i just had that conversation tonight because uh i was with this with my buddy and he's like 56 and he runs and whatever and he's like how long do you think you could do this because he right. still thinks i'm like like stunt guy and right like yeah i do some stuff that's like dangerous and once in a while, I still do something that I'm like, I think it's pretty cool. But I think the difference between like when somebody thinks of a pro athlete, like Tom Brady or something, you right. know, like a, an, an older pro athlete. Yeah. If I, if you told me that when I went out with, for a bike ride that I was going to like every, every bike ride, I was, well, once a week, I was going to go out for a bike ride and I was going to have like three or four hard crashes. Yeah. And then I needed to, no matter what, practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday after those crashes. And then no matter what, do it again on Sunday. I'd be right. like, there's no way I'm doing that. But like when I know I have Sedona Fat Tire Festival coming up or something, I'm like, ooh, I better start like training a little bit. And if I feel a little tired, I'm like, you know, what? I'm going to take two days off. And if I if it's Monday and I feel like shit and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to ride that really hard trail for my YouTube video. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Like you have that ability to like change it around and right, right. stretch it out. The grind, like when you listen to what it takes an NBA player to to play, play in the NBA, these guys get off the court, they go straight into physical therapy. It's like full-time recovery till from a Sunday till a Tuesday to play again. Like that's right. not what we're living in. So like, I right. would not be, I, I, I would still hop into a competition here or there, but could I compete all the time? Absolutely not. Like yeah. I'd be delusional to think so, but can I cherry pick once in a while or like yeah. maybe ride a trail that like nobody's ridden once in a while? Sure. You just, right. you just can't do it all the time. Like you can't when you're 30 years old, like it's just ridiculous to think so. So, I was having that conversation tonight with somebody. He's like, how long do you think you could do that? Do this. And I was like, well, so much of my job nowadays, like my favorite thing to do is to make instructional videos. Like I love doing that. Right. But then I always want to like validate it. I want somebody to like go to my channel. And if they watch a few how to's every now and then I like to throw in something like that, uh, like bottom up in Sedona that I did a few few months ago where like nobody's cleaned it. Like I want to do something to like when people are like, why should I watch this dude's videos? Yeah. Oh, he's still pretty good. You know? Yeah. He's still like, pretty good. Still like validated. Like, <laughs> you know, he's not bad. Right. Um, and then like, then I'll make some how-to videos and then I'm like, okay, I don't want to just only make how-to videos. Like let me try to do something cool and then I'll do some more how-to videos or ride with my friends or, you know, then a huge part of my job now is doing marketing for Reeb and group rides and things yeah. like that. It's like, I mean, it's, you don't need to be 25 years old to go do group rides with your friends and yeah, an awesome group of people. Like, 
right, right. Everybody has fun. So I don't know. I like, I'm hoping I can still do it for quite a bit longer. I'm really interested. Like, I'm just not sure. Like, 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 obviously, like a guy like you and me, dude, we're, I, and this is going to be like not 100% accurate because I definitely have subscribers that are, are young. But for the most part, like the people that watch us are our demographic, right? Like, most My demographic of our is, is our demographic. It's right. super like, strong, 35 to 55. I have yeah. more subscribers over 55 than I have under 25. Right. That's insane, and, and right? the exact same way. Same way, right? So and it's the like, channels with huge numbers, I think, I think have that young demographic. Yeah. Yeah. Like I don't Seth, think, for example, I don't, Seth, like a hundred percent. Seth has like that freaking the, the teenage to like 22 demographic, like, right. you know what I mean? He's probably I've got ne- guys that are 50, like, I've never met a 15 year old kid that says they don't subscribe to Seth's bike hack. Right. Exactly. But I mean, it's also, he did. I don't watch a lot of bike YouTube videos. Honestly, uh-huh. this isn't just blowing smoke up your ass. I watch your podcast because I like it. I watch a lot of Jeff Kendall weed. I uh-huh. watch every single freaking Seth Bike Hacks video. Yeah. Every one I of watch my all his stuff. friends, like even if they're pros, they'll be like, that's corny. I'm like, it's super entertaining. I like, like, yeah. I like it. It's awesome. Like, I love watching all his videos. He does such a good job. I watch his all of Bobo skits. Yeah, yeah, I watch all of those skits. Um, and, you know, like, so there's definitely, like, the younger kids that watch that stuff, but, like, he does an awesome job. Yeah. You know? Rightfully so, you know? Like, you get you get views for making good videos. That's the bottom line there. That's the part I'll where like, I always, do, like... I'll be like, do I really want to see if this fat bike will float? And then 10 minutes later, I'm like, shit, I just watched that whole thing. Yes, the fat <laughs> bike floats. I always joke around. I would watch that guy like install a toilet, and um, you know, since he started doing the 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 express channel, it's like there's only a matter of time until that guy installs a toilet. And I'm like, oh god, it happened, and I watched it. Dude, he should definitely troll people and just like see what's the most mundane task he could do that people will watch. Right. Because I'm right. sure people watch. I'm sure I'll I'll watch it for sure. He's I mean, even his latest series where he's like flipping bikes, it's like. There's not anything like that he's teaching me in that. There's not anything that he's like um, clickbaiting me in that. Like, I'm just watching it because I know it's going to be good content. And it, it's like always a good story. Like, it's a, he's good at telling stories. You know what I mean? Yeah. I am a terrible storyteller. I understand that. And I'm too pragmatic because I'll be like, do it. Like, I'm the worst. Like, I'll get a brand new bike and I'm like, I should totally film this whole thing slow-mo glamour shot like paul the punter yeah. everything and i'm like i'm not doing it. i just want to put it together and ride it like i can't do that like yeah. i literally can't do it i know that like i suck at that so bad or um like the flip bike well not only like, not only filming that like jeff though like i i'm the same as you it, it's the filming it but like also editing it is just no fun to me like yeah, i, I i'm it. not interested like I would love yeah. to, to like edit this ride that I did because I'm like stoked off of it, you know, but like building the bike and like the glamour shots, like I, I can't do it either, dude. I'm just not there. So, yeah. So then I wonder if there is a correlation between, and I mean, those like, he's obviously still doing it. Well, actually he was like super fed up on YouTube recently. Like, is there a correlation between like, I totally realize that I'm not a very good YouTuber. Like I, you say I have a, a good channel, but like the competitive side of me is always like, it should be more. Right. But I'm very happy with my audience. It's like a very strong demographic. It's 75,000 followers. If I do a fundraiser or something and ask for help or whatever, like everybody supports me. If I say I'm doing a ride, people come out. I don't know if you have that with like some of the bigger channels that have a more diverse audience like age wise or something, or if it's casual yeah, yeah. observer, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like, I feel like my audience is down. Like they're, they're yeah. down for the cause, which That's is awesome. awesome. Like I said, yeah, I'd always yeah. like it to be bigger, but it's quality. Like it's super quality. And they're all dudes that like dudes and girls. Like when I go to events and they want to ride, like, I'm like, hell yeah, it's awesome. Like you yeah. already feel like, you know, people, you know, right. Um, right. 
I wonder, so I realize that I'm a shitty YouTuber, but I only do stuff that I like. Yeah. So I wonder if that's like what helps, helps you not get burnt out. Cause if you're just doing stuff for the views and it's not even stuff that you really like. Yeah. Of course it's going to get freaking boring. Like that's why I started doing that 90 second review thing, dude. Cause like I hate editing review videos and I, and I'm not really good at like, even like making up 15 minutes of shit to talk about something. Right. But I have like pretty strong opinions on shit, right? Like lots of my friends have bought things because I'm like, oh, this is the way I feel about it. And realistically, when you're talking to your buddy, you don't tell your buddy for fucking 15 minutes about how much you love this pump. Right. right. 90 seconds and you're done. Yeah. Right. You tell them in like a minute and a half, dude, this thing freaking sucks whenever I do this, but I really like that it does that and it costs too much, but I would buy it again. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, and like. So you're like totally oh. overpriced, but I would totally buy it again. Right, right. You know, and and not and and I mean that's why I started doing those because I was like, a I wanted to be able to make some more content, and I wanted to like those those videos are like super easy to make. Like I just go yeah. out to my garage. It takes me like 15 minutes of recording. Maybe I record that 90 seconds like three or four times until I'm like, oh shit, I forgot I wanted to say that. You know, and I gotta like get it right, you know? So 15 minutes of recording another like 30 minutes of editing and, and boom, I got a video, you know, instead of like three hours of writing, 12 hours of editing, you know what I mean? Like, and then you got a 15 minute video, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's when I know that I suck at YouTubing. When I watch Instagram stories of other guys that are super successful at it, that are like, talk about scripting. And I'm like, yeah, you guys script, right? And I'm like, oh, that's why I take 75 takes. And like, if you watch any of my how tos, it's probably shot over like three different days. I dig through the laundry basket, put on the same shirt because I'm like, shit, I forgot to say this. And I put on the same t shirt and then I go out and I'm like, fuck, the light's not the same. Oh, maybe nobody will notice. And I, right. and then I'll like go editing. I'm like, Oh, you didn't say this. And then I like go dig the shirt out for a third day and I put it on. Dude, that happens all the time. I can't believe that people script when I see people like, you know, let me like help you out. Let me help, it's let awesome. me help you out right here. Awesome videos. Like shoot more B roll and everything that you forget, you voice over. Right. Right. <laughs> but then for me, then it's like, do I go stand outside with the GoPro? Like, I'll walk out my front door and I hold the GoPro here. Like, I never know. Like, do I get my Yeti microphone inside and make it, like, sound all official? Do I go outside and, like, try to simulate what I was, like, I've gone ah, out dude. on my bike in front of my house and ridden down the street so I get air noise and, like, oh, say nice. stuff into my, into my <laughs> chest cam so that, like, maybe it matches. And I'm like, shit, it totally doesn't match. I'm so, telling you right now, do a voiceover with your good mic and it doesn't matter, dude. I just have good re be like, I'm, I'm going to tell you advice that I don't follow myself, but I'm telling you like these guys that I watch that shoot a lot of good B roll, like you can put whatever you want to say on top of, of some kind of panning shot or some kind like, like somebody like right, uh, right. the Colorado kid, his, his channel is still pretty, pretty new, but man, he shoots so much good B roll where it's like. You know, like the same shit that Seth does, where it's like a leaf freaking just sitting there and like right, right, somebody, totally. you know what yeah. I mean? And it's like all yeah. this little shit where it's like you can use those like little pans into the bike or a little you riding by. It's just your wheels. And it's like you can say all kinds of stuff and not and like that's the, the footage that you use for whenever you like forgot to say something. I know that's those are the moments I realize that I'm a bike rider, not a filmmaker. Yeah, because yeah. I suck at it. Like, yeah. I'm a bike rider. I screw it up. Yeah. So I, I totally screw it up when I always do, like, I don't script ever and it shows. And <laughs> then also, um, I'll watch videos of like dudes with awesome channels, like BCPOV or something might yeah. be like 16 hours into the edit. And I'm like, wait, is that 16 hours of like, looking at Instagram and replying to emails and like ADD and like <laughs> editing and like going out and like whatever. And I'm like, are you literally grinding for 16 hours? Cause if you are, that would probably make sense why your videos get 10 times my views. 
Right. But if that includes it, then then I'm bummed. Yeah. Because I'm, yeah. I'm like all over the place. I'll like edit and then I'm like, oh, I should answer that email. Oh, I wonder who won the World Cup this weekend. Oh, let me see what the New York Giants are doing. Oh, let me see what's on Instagram. I don't know. Let me make a sandwich. Let me edit. Like, yeah, dude. I, I'm pretty much in the same boat as you, man. I'm freaking stuck by every shiny ball that flies by my head, man. But um, I've definitely gotten a lot better at it, you know? And, and uh, it's interesting to see how that happens over time. You know, like, I feel like my story's gotten a lot better and th those type of things. But at the end of the day, what people really want to see is you being stoked. And you can't fake that, right? Like you can't fake being stoked. So I think that's the, the, that's the real secret, you know, that that's really what it is. Like you can't make that noise. Like when you hit a jump and you like land it or like you PR some trail or whatever it is, go through some technical feature. Like you can't do that and like fake the way that that your voice sounds when you're excited. No, it's totally true that like the two best videos I've made in the past, well, not what I'm most psyched on, but the videos that I've done the best have been the two videos where I've been like completely scared shitless, like not lying, whatever. One was riding Thunder Bike Park, this huge jump line, and I was like completely scared shit. And that video did awesome. And riding the white line, I don't think it's just because it's a white line. Like I was scared shit riding the white line. And that yeah. one did good. But then it's like, say that bottoms up climb, like, that's just like a very technical thing. There's nothing on there that's impossible. It's like trying to throw 10 bullseyes. Like it's just hard. Like it's not impossible. None of it's that impossible. That was a really just good trying video. To like, did, did that was just trying well? to like put it all together. I edited that myself and I actually did like storyboard that a little bit. I was kind of I mean, proud did of that one. Well? I don't know what the, like what's the view count? It did, like? did pretty good. Well? It got like 30,000 views, but then yeah, I rode okay. the so white decent. line and it got like 180,000 views. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, there's like 10,000 people that ride the white line and that's, I'm the first person that's ever climbed that trail. So you would think that that would do better. Like I was more stoked on that one, but in the white line, I was genuinely scared. Yeah. And that other jump video, like I was, the, you know, it's a jump, it's a jump trail. It's designed to be jumped. Like that's what it's designed to, yeah. to be just cause I was scared. That doesn't mean anything. Like it's designed yeah. to be jumped, but I just happen to be scared. But when people see those real emotions or they see somebody that like, maybe it's letting your guard down. Yeah. You know, yeah, like yeah. for some, for some YouTubers like that emotion is very common. Maybe for some, if you're a pro rider, like you gotta be like, you gotta like pretend like you're not scared. Like it's a, it's vulnerable for me to like hit a jump line that's designed to be jumped and like admit that I was scared shit. Yeah. Because like, of course you're just supposed to do it. Like right. I was fucking scared. <laughs> like I was yeah, really yeah. scared. And I was like, well, here it goes. Like we're just gonna do it. I'm gonna ask and you it did question, awesome. And then I'm gonna go grab a beer out of my fridge because okay. now that you've you've done it like 16 times, it's your turn. So um <laughs> and plus I'm drinking IPA, so like I'm still a man, not drinking hard seltzer, but <laughs> what uh what what has been the most difficult like kind of uh one of those videos that you've done where you're like, man, I'm trying to accomplish, like, like conquer this thing. That's hard. That's what you keep doing in your videos. You've done a lot of them now for a couple uh -huh. of years. What's the one that really stands out to you as being the hardest? Probably that horse thief bench climb. Um, so that one was really challenging because I had seen it 11 years prior. I just rode down it. It kind of had all the elements. Like I rode down it. 11 years ago and already said like saw it and I was like oh that would be cool to ride up but it was just like not really even thinking about it it's in a really popular location like horse East bench if you want to go do mary's loop when you're in in fruta which is a blue loop and it's really beautiful and it's like not super difficult like you have to hike a bike down that yeah. trail so like it's a trail that a lot of people see you know so yeah a lot of people are familiar with it and what we were saying earlier like that goes a, a really long way of like when you make a video everything looks easy so 
it's that hard one really get, works hard. It's hard to get that validation. So when you ride, when you ride popular trails, it, and you have somebody comment like, wow, I can't even ride down that, or I've never seen anybody ride that or whatever. Like it validates it. Yeah, if I yeah. built a hard trail in my backyard, it doesn't resonate. So you got to right. ride those popular trails. Um, so I saw it a, a really long time ago. I thought it was something that could be cool. Then I tried it three years ago and like wasn't even remotely close. Like I tried it like two or three times and was like, this is never happening. And then I saw a video of a trials guy who's really, really awesome ride up it, but it had like a bunch of camera cuts in it. So I was like, so then you didn't I don't know. know how I went from there to there. Like right, right. That doesn't like seem the, like it makes sense. That's that's the shitty part of learning how to edit. All of a sudden you look at things that way and you're like, Right. He might not have done it. <laughs> and from like if you're if you're a proficient trials rider, there's nothing on horse C bench that's impossible. Right. Any any pro level trials rider can make it up that trail. I wasn't like it's not like I'm the best rider in the world. Anybody could do that. But it's like, all right, who's going to be the idiot that's willing to try to sing as many times as it takes to not screw up something stupid? Because right. that's like, you know, again, it's like, is throwing a bullseye impossible? No. Are you willing to stand there for 10 hours to throw 10 in a row? Probably right. not. That's what that's when like everybody's like, screw it. I'm not like, yeah, but yeah. I'm, I've always been that idiot. Like I'm, I've always been that guy. Like, if we were sitting here and there was a trash can and I threw my crumpled up piece of paper and it missed, like I'd get up and I'd sit back in the same spot and I'd try to throw it. And if I miss yeah. again, I'd come back and sit in the same spot and I'm going to sit there until I make the shot. Like, right. That's just always been the way I am. <laughs> so like climbing horse seas bench, like anybody, not any, like could Danny McCaskill climb that? Absolutely. Do, would, could he do it without making a mistake? Maybe not. Does he want to sit there and try for five hours to see if he could probably not who knows you know what i mean yeah so with that i tried three years ago couldn't even come close then i tried like the spring of the the year that i tried it and i couldn't really do it i i made it with like five dabs and whatever and i was like it would be really sweet to just string this whole thing together so it was like so a bucket went, list thing for you almost then it was a bucket you, list thing for because you've been like trying over, like over, over, over 10 again. years yeah yeah, over yeah. 10 years <laughs> so the thing that like helped me get it was when i tried it in the spring then i was aware of like exactly what it would take to do it um and it's like just not screwing stuff up being relatively fit well, it's, it's being relatively fit and just not screwing things up. Th those are the two recipes. Really it. And like just knowing the right path and like memorizing the thing. Uh, but when I went, when I did do it, um, I think it was only like the fourth or fifth try that day. Like I tried it two or three times, screwed up, made it pretty far, screwed up. And then like I just did it. And then the thing with those, with those climbs are the, the further you get into them, like that's when like you really start to like worry that you're going to screw it up. Like, yeah, if you're the nerve, screw it up, then, yeah. Then screw it up. It's like better that. to screw it up at the beginning, like, right? Because then you only you got screw it up at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And then be like, okay, I start over. Like when yeah, you, you get, get like, halfway up, three quarters into it up. or something, and you're like beat, and then you screw it up. You're like, you're joking, right? And then you do that again, and you're like, holy crap. Yeah. So is this the further you get, you're like. Please don't mess up. Please don't mess up. Please don't mess up. How long were you out there that day until you actually like, like, like that was only the, like maybe the fifth try. Oh, wow. So you like just, totally got one. Just yeah. went out and pinned it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. How hard is it to go down that? Like, do you think like, like, like I'd be able to do it? I don't know. We haven't ridden together um, in a while. My skill set's so, a lot better than the last time you and I rode together. So there's really like, one pivotal move on that trail in my opinion that's like really 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 difficult the uh -huh. rest of it i know for sure you can ride down it it gets to like this the spot where there's this one rock slab and in order to get on the rock slab you need to take this like funky line off if you watch a video of me climbing i do this like uh -huh. big step up right uh -huh. now normally you would just roll down that and that would be super right. easy you could do that for sure 
But right. then that sets you up really shitty for that one rock slab roll down, which I didn't do when I climb it because that's not conducive to coming up. Yeah. So is it the one like, that's like most of the way down and then right when it starts to cut left? It's all the way like at the bottom. Big, yeah, it's all the yeah, way at the bottom. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking like, that's the only spot be, that I see in the videos that looks like, yeah, oh, that so looks very. Nowadays, it's so eroded. In in that video that I made, I posted a magazine cover because I had a magazine cover of riding down that from like 2011 or something. It was completely different. Yeah. You used to be able to like ride down that thing, no problem. And instead of getting on that slab rock, there was a spot to the right of it that you could just roll through. If you watch old Nate Hill's videos, if you watch... Uh -huh. You know, different people like you could just roll right to the right of that, roll down, no problem. It wasn't like a big deal, or you know, as long as you had a good bike and whatever. Um, yeah, but good in bike and years, good balls are good. Yeah, like in, in recent years, you kind of got to go on that slab, and uh -huh. it just gives you a funky setup. So, if if you if you asked if can you do it with like one one dab or one reset, I'd be like 100. percent You could ride down the whole thing. Yeah. Do like the the roll down reset your bike and set up for that slab which is kind of sketchy but if you just trust that it grips it's fine yeah. i'm sure you could do that but it's really hard to like link that together because you got to do like a weird roll downs kind of side yeah. cut thing to get onto that slab i did it on my hardtail and i got like kind of rowdy on it and it and it worked and that's that's the other thing like i rode it on my hardtail i rode down that thing and i think it got like 200,000 views and I was the first person ever to climb it and it got like 50,000 views. Like <laughs> YouTube's funny, dude. Yeah. That's that that's that like it's the pickup line, man. I think that's most of it on YouTube is the thumbnail. You know, that's yeah, your pickup but, line, your thumbnail and your title and and if that's <laughs> not good, you're fucked. Yeah, but when I see like, you know, riders that like I'm super stoked on say they watched it and they're you know they respect it or whatever yeah. that's that's what that's more important than like yeah yeah more views or whatever yeah so yeah no i hear you there for sure man what are you uh what are you well, looking forward to i'm looking forward to the fall like i'm hoping everything stays status quo we have the new jersey mountain bike festival coming up we have uh sea otter sedona mountain bike festival Bentonville Bike Festival or Outer Bike Bentonville. So if everything goes are you driving according to Seattle to Grant, or are you uh, flying? Uh, I probably will drive to Seattle because I'm usually out there doing um, this uh, outreach program ahead of time. We go to a bunch of schools and like get kids stoked on cycling. And uh, I just like to have. So you're doing the, the candy and, thing while you're out here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I like to be out there. I like to get, um, I like to have all my gear. And then nowadays it's like fifty thousand dollars to rent a car anyway, so I might as well just drive my van and keep it out there for Sedona, all that other stuff. So I'm hoping it's going to be a busy fall between, like I said, the New Jersey festivals, Outer Bike, Bentonville, Sea Otter, Sedona. Yeah. Like if all that stuff goes good and I can get to out and ride with a bunch of people, it's going to be awesome. Well, if California stops burning down and you have extra time, let's let's get together and ride. I would like I'll to. definitely I would see. Like I'll definitely see you at um, at Sea Otter. I actually yeah. um have an email out to them right now. Their their marketing lady got back to me, and I'm trying to get them on the podcast. I feel like that'd be fun to talk about how that like Sea Otter. Out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, awesome. Yeah, and then um, but I mean, outside of that, like it'd be fun to ride something something here local. At the very least, we could go down. We could ride like UC together or something like that. And yeah, that would be awesome. Lot, Let's do it. Lot, Lots of good stuff down there. I mean, not that we condone riding illegal trails. We'll ride the, right. uh, the legal ones, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Cool, man. Well, this was a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I appreciate you uh, hanging out for almost two hours here with me because... It's always it's always fun hanging out with you. Yeah, dude. I definitely. feel like you're one of my college buddies or something. <laughs> That's good, dude. I, I, uh, I appreciate that, man. I always, I always totally enjoy talking to you as well. And, um, let's see here how I wrap this thing up. I'm trying to, trying to figure it all out now. I always um, think it's funny when I like, the, the, I, I think you're getting dementia though, buddy. Like the last few podcasts, you start them and you're like, this is the biker. I'm like, 
Dude, it's episode 97. Come on, you can't forget. You think I'd be dialed by now, but I'm not, dude. It's like, you're like, this it's is... like do you have another podcast that you're two-timing us with? That's what it is. Another one, and you're like, wait, you which guys, one is this this week? You guys don't know anything about my, my hard seltzer basket weaving channel. <laughs> I mean, I know BKXT had the uh, the water sprinkler podcast, and he had yeah, the yeah. audio book podcast. Like, are you two-timing us? I really feel like I should be. Because if I had another channel that was killing it, that would be great. I'd be like, this would be my side <laughs> hustle or something like that. But unfortunately, this is the only place, only people that mountain bike are willing to look at look at me and listen to me. So maybe someday I'll make like a widget channel or something like that. Hey, man, I, I really nice. appreciate you, you coming, hanging out with me, dude. It's always an awesome time chatting. And um, I, I can't wait to, to, to chat with you in person, share a beer in Sea Otter for sure. Sedona will have to go down to the pizza shop there and tear up some wings hopefully yes. my friends don't try to beat each other up again like the last time we <laughs> were there but <laughs> anyways those of you guys that are listening if you enjoyed the podcast hit the subscribe button hit the thumbs up button hit the whatever you hit on the podcast app that you're listening to this on that would be great if you guys want to shave some grams off your back or your chest or your balls i don't know any of those things hit up manscape.com use code biker b1ker Get 20% off, free shipping. What do you know? Just like that. You'll be KOM and like I said at the beginning of this thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, with all that. KOM being said, code word for something? What's that? I said it's KOM code word for something. It could be. You guys <laughs> use your imagination, man. So nonetheless, uh, once you guys remember one thing, it only takes a bike to be a biker. Get out and be one, bitches. <laughs> Awesome. I don't even know when this.